It's really great to be back after six years. UGA was one of my favorite conferences ever, so I'm really thrilled to be here. And this evening, I'm going to talk specifically about the importance of the humanities for psychedelic research. Although the arts and humanities are often dismissed as less practical or important than the sciences, this dismissal ignores the fact that these fields provide access to the inherently creative cognitive processes that underlie our perceptions and our expectations and experiences, both ordinary and non-ordinary. The humanities in particular are concerned with the relationship between narrative and meaning making, which is also central to psychedelic science research. After all, mo most psychedelics researchers believe that transformative experiences are central to their th therapeutic effects. As Roland Griffiths of Johns Hopkins explained in a recent interview with Vice Magazine, part of the nature of the experience that people have and the way people explain why they change has to do with their interpretation and the meaning of the experience. So this is very much about meaning making. Since the lasting impact of psychedelic experiences is shaped by the stories that study participants tell, and since these stories also impact the public's views on psychedelics research, this field should take the study of these narratives seriously. So far, few published scientific studies have investigated the relationship between psychedelics and language in any capacity. Since the resurgence of psychedelic research in the 21st century, Nilafar family and colleagues have pioneered the use of psychedelics to study the neurobiology of language. During a 2015 break, uh, a presentation at Breaking Convention in the UK, family provided an overview of the few studies that preceded her own work. She said how in 1965, researchers Amrel and Sheik asked participants under the influence of LSD to describe themselves while looking into a, a mirror. After transcribing their responses, the researchers replaced every fifth word with a blank, like with a Mad Libs template. When anonymous readers were then asked to fill in the blanks with their best guesses about the missing words, the researchers concluded that these LSD-influenced descriptions were less predictable than descriptions given when the participants were sober. In other words, the readers were less accurate in guessing the missing words in the LSD transcripts, indicating participants' use of unconventional grammar and word choices. In their own study, family and colleagues asked participants to name objects shown in a series of pictures. They noted that subjects on LSD were more likely to supply incorrect but associated substitutions, like saying the word foot for leg, which is in line with previous characterizations of psychedelic experiences as hyper-associative. In discussing the limitations of their methodology, Family and colleagues proposed that a less directed and more naturalistic approach, such as asking participants to speak freely about an image rather than being more directed, could result in a more significant findings, writing that, quote, this is from their study, it is worth considering the limitations of this approach when studying a compound whose principal action seems to be on spontaneous as opposed to evoked processes. The incorporation of measures that sample spontaneous language production under psychedelics maybe a more natural, practical, and informative approach, therefore. Regarding the larger field of psychedelic research, most studies to date have been quantitative and nomothetic, meaning that they test for pre-established outcome measures like levels of anxiety or depression, and they generalize trends across multiple cases through statistical analysis. So it's about averages rather than individuals. This type of research is important for generating data capable of reassuring institutional review boards and government regulators, but it's limited to testing for known quantities within pre-existing conceptual frameworks. In a 2012 Horizons presentation, Alex Belser argued for the importance of complementing these qual uh, quantitative studies with more qualitative, ideographic research into the narrative content of individual psychedelic experiences by studying how people ascribe meaning and significance to their experiences through language we can learn more about the transformational potential of psychedelics and consequently generate new testable hypotheses for future research. And although qualitative research works best with descriptive information rich narratives, psychedelics present multiple challenges to verbalization. For starters, the primary function of everyday language is to describe external reality rather than the contents of subjective experience. Even words for emotions like happiness, Anger and shame are only stock labels. They're broad prototypical categories that reduce the complexity of lived experience to abstract common denominators. 
As the philosopher Walter Kaufman has argued, the primary function of language is practical, to communicate what is of social importance. For Western languages at least, Kaufman notes that distinctions between things and shapes and sizes have practical consequences and a correspondingly large vocabulary to describe them. For subtle shades of taste and smell, on the other hand, we have fewer words at our disposal. It is for this reason that wine critics tend to rely so heavily on a range of metaphors and figurative language to describe different palates and aromatic profiles. This basic problem is compounded when describing unprecedented experiences and non-ordinary states of consciousness. In the absence of linguistic conventions, verbal descriptions of psychedelic experiences necessarily rely on metaphor and other creative uses of language. These challenges to verbalization have, have bolstered the popular association of psychedelics with ineffability, or the belief that aspects of the experience are impossible to express in words. Since an uncritical acceptance of ineffability can discourage attempts to describe psychedelic effects, because it's impossible, it's important to clarify the multiple meanings of this concept. On the one hand, ineffability refers to the idea that some aspects of psychedelic states must be experienced in order to, to be understood, and that no amount of reading or conversation will prepare you for them. The classic example of this is Aldous Huxley, who literally wrote the book on comparative mysticism, but couldn't understand key mystical concepts until his own mescaline experience nearly 10 years later. Bill Richards of Johns Hopkins describes a different sense of ineffability in his book, Sacred Knowledge. Writing, quote, it's been likened to how a caveman might respond were he suddenly transported into Manhattan today, surrounded by skyscrapers, subways, jetliners, and people texting on cell phones. When, upon returning to his cave, were his wife to ask, Gorg, what did you experience? All the poor, poor man could do is grunt and perhaps say it was big, loud, and impressive. It may be that concepts derived from consensus reality are insufficient to fathom these extraordinary concept, uh, uh, contexts. But is this necessarily an insurmountable problem? If Gore could make return visits to Manhattan, could he notice patterns in the buzzing chaos and begin to label them? The proliferation of linguistic experiments can begin to clarify themes that were once ineffable. Bill Richards continues writing, perhaps as more English-speaking people articulate mystical experiences to one another, some new terms may emerge that might prove useful. And even if attempted descriptions are incomplete or imperfect, each new description potentially functions as a useful tool for navigating and communicating future experiences, as Richard Doyle suggests in Darwin's Pharmacy. If we accept that the generation of useful data is partly a matter of linguistic innovation, it follows that some cavemen might be more effective wordsmiths than others. Existing studies are already grappling with the, the issue of recruiting participants who are capable of generating meaningful data. Researchers at Johns Hopkins and NYU are providing psilocybin to religious leaders, quote, to see if these ministers can use their spiritual practice and the vocabulary of religious study to provide insight into those sacred psychedelic moments that so often seem to transcend words. That was in a, 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 a article about it in Quartz magazine. And Johns Hopkins has completed a similar study with experienced meditators partly to see what trained contemplatives can tell us about the experience, according to principal investigator Roland Griffiths. If specialized training with techniques of introspection and the use of emotive vocabularies contributes to participants' abilities to communicate psychedelic experiences, I argue that the inclusion of practicing poets in future protocols would be a natural extension of the logic underlying these existing studies. After all, linguist R.S. Sharma writes that the fundamental function of poetic language is, quote, to de convert denotation into connotation, the language of objective reference into that of feeling and mood. Poetry employs creative metaphors to communicate subtle nuances of subjective experience, and the poetic transfer of meaning inherent to metaphor making constitutes a universal linguistic device for communicating novel and unprecedented experiences. In the process of verbalizing the interiorized effects of moderate to high-dose psychedelics, poetic language and creative metaphors are often evoked spontaneously. There's also a historical precedent for psychedelic research with creative writers. During the 1950s and early 1960s, Dr. Oscar Janiger administered LSD to writers and artists 
an attempt to understand the um, impact of psychedelics on creativity. In 1961, famed nutritionist Adele Davis, under the pseudonym of Jane Dunlap, published her experiences in Jenninger's study as the book Exploring Inner Space. In the introduction, Davis notes the importance of her vocation as a published writer for her enrollment in the study, writing, quote, when research is being done on a drug whose effects are physical, these effects can be studied by measuring the blood pressure, analyzing body fluids, and similar techniques. If the drug affects the mind, however, about the only way its effect can become known is by having hundreds of persons describe what happened to them while under its influence. The problem, therefore, becomes partly one of finding persons capable of writing full and accurate descriptions. Many people find it difficult to express what they have seen and felt. For example, an alcoholic given LSD was asked to write a report of his experience. He complied, but it contained only four words, God, what a binge. Although many scholars have argued that psychedelics can induce experiences that are indistinguishable from spontaneous mystical experiences, it does not necessarily follow that existing religious vocabularies are sufficient for describing the full range of potential psychedelic phenomena. In the absence of a scholarly consensus about the best way to describe psychedelic experiences, much could be learned from the testimony of practicing poets and other creative writers who are trained to communicate subtleties of affect and subjective experience. There is even a historical precedent for such cognitive literary experimentation in Australia. Although Marcus Clark is described by scholars as the most notable prose writer of colonial Australia and the first experimental Australian short story writer, few have commented on the significance of his 1868 essay, Cannabis Indica. So in the introduction, Clark explains how he developed an experimental question, writing, it has often struck me that though we have accounts of the dreams and sensations of opium and hashish eaters, written after their recovery, no man had ever willingly given to the world a poem or story composed while under the effects of a narcotic. I think that a story written under the influence of hashish may be interesting from a psychological point of view. Clark intentionally identifies this literary experiment as a means of investigating the impact of a psychoactive substance on cognitive processes. His experiment represents an explicit precedent to contemporary psychedelic research protocols since Clark's dosage is carefully measured and administered under medical supervision. Clark published the resulting story alongside the doctor's laboratory notes, which include time-stamped records of Clark's objective vitals and physical behaviors over the duration of the trial. He also includes a subjective trip report section where he reports on his subjective experiences, including possible influences of the set and setting provided after the fact. In his conclusions from the experiment, Clark characterizes the drug's effects in a formulation that pre predated Huxley's Doors of Perception by nearly a century, writing, quote, the drug seems to unlock the doors of thought and our ideas, instead of being induced one by the other, as in the case of normal ratiocination, appear to flow out in a mingled stream. In a just published book, Duke University professor Anne Catherine Hales writes of recent discoveries in neuroscience that confirm the existence of non-conscious cognitive processes. These processes are inaccessible to conscious introspection, but are nevertheless essential for consciousness to function. However, this dichotomy between conscious and non-conscious ignores the possibility raised by Clark that some non-conscious cognitive processes, like non-linear forms of cognition, could become available to introspection during non-ordinary states of consciousness. Clark's example shows the extent to which neuroscientific investigations of consciousness could incorporate such experiments in their, design, their study designs and protocols. As a corollary to collaboration with poets, I also argue for the inclusion of humanity scholars in qualitative psychedelic research. Since scholars of poetry and literature are trained to discern meaning in non-ordinary language, literary scholars are well positioned to articulate the significance of linguistic data in the context of qualitative research. In 2014, I was hired as a research fellow for the NYU Psilocybin Cancer Anxieties Project's first qualitative study uh, of patient experiences. The results of this study were described in two articles published recently in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. And I first learned about the plans for this study from uh, Alex Belser's 2012 Horizons Conference pre uh, presentation. Two years later, Belser posted a job call in the MAPS Graduate Student Association listserv 
which has been an important resource for the new generation of psychedelic scholars for the past five years. And you can find it by going to the maps.org website and searching for student resources. When I first saw Belser's email, I assumed that as a literary scholar without training in medicine or psychology, I wouldn't be competitive for the position. But when I read that the study involved close reading patient interviews for recurring themes, I wrote to Belser immediately. I wrote, would you consider hiring a PhD candidate in comparative literature as one of the research assistants involved with coding transcripts? Although my degree is in the humanities rather than the sciences, my dissertation predominantly analyzes written accounts of psychedelic experiences, a skill which would be highly transferable to analyzing and coding transcripts. The interviews we analyzed were drawn from 12 patients who participated in NYU's parent study, which aimed to demonstrate that psilocybin can help reduce cancer-related anxiety. Although this outcome is being demonstrated quantitatively, our study was the first to analyze patient transcripts for recurring themes and figurative language. We asked, what is it about the content of these psychedelic experiences that makes them so transformative? Although brain imaging technology has advanced over the last few decades, verbal narrative remains the only way to access that content. In my contribution to the draft manuscript, I summarized participants' descriptions of transpersonal insights into the nature of the universe during the course of their psilocybin session. These feelings of insight seem to come from a source beyond their personal or psychological histories as they themselves uh, explained. Five participants experienced revelations that made metaphysical concepts tangible where they had previously seemed vague, uncertain, or overly abstract, which relates to the first definition of ineffability that I offered earlier in the talk. Long have I known the theory of it, is a quote, but now I know I feel it. Among these experiential understandings were the nature of space-time, the foundational role of love in the universe, uh, the interconnectedness of all things, and even the importance of experiential understanding itself. In addition to providing new insights about old ideas, five participants described arriving at new ideas with a felt sense of conviction. Among these perceptions were the existence of a parallel level of reality and the possibility of discarnate or disembodied perception. These insights were often described as nonverbal, as one participant stated, quote, you don't understand it strictly in your head, you understand it as a being, as a body. The nonverbal nature of certain psilocybin insights appeared foundational to many participants, with 10 participants alluding to ineffability or difficulty characterizing their experiences in words. Four participants described encountering a spiritual, re spiritual reality beyond the ability of language to describe. Meanwhile, seven participants attempted to describe significant aspects of their experience while simultaneously insisting that their descriptions did not adequately capture them. Quote, you cannot express what is happening. You have a complete blockage because there is no vocab. There is no word. Three participants relied on paradoxical juxtapositions of words to compensate for the limitations of language, using poetic phrases like formless mass, indescribable confluence of joy and sorrow, and wonderful nothingness. By paying attention to the language that people use to describe their psychedelic experiences, we can expand the sorts of questions that science can ask about them. We can discover recurring patterns or variables that we wouldn't otherwise know to look for, and we can encourage study participants to reflect more deeply about their experiences. This return to introspection also provides a means of addressing some of the lingering biases associated with psych psychology's decades-long obsession with behaviorism. Behaviorism insisted that science could only investigate observable behavior, denying the possibility of discussing subjective mental processes. At its most extreme, it even denied the uh, existence of such mental processes altogether. John Watson, who introduced behaviorism to the United States in the early 20th century, argued that the time has come when psychology must discard all reference to consciousness. Its sole task is the prediction and control of behavior. And so if you've re read Huxley's Brave New World, that's the sort of idea behind that book. Behaviorism appealed to psychologists for its rigorous methodology, offering the approximation of a hard science at a time when psychology was vying for legitimacy. The magnitude of behaviorism's impact is evident in the discipline's leading reference books, which avoided the terms introspection and consciousness until the late 1980s. Although fields ranging from neuroscience to psychiatry have resumed an interest in studying consciousness, there is still anxiety about the imprecision involved in qualitative research. 
But even though it isn't as simple as measuring something with a ruler, that doesn't mean that we should avoid working with the data provided by narrative reports. The anxiety about qualitative research is a symptom of the same cultural forces that devalue the importance of the humanities. In light of the cultural factors inherent to set and setting, psychedelic studies provide a particularly clear example of why the humanities deserve a place in the larger conversation. In essence, the sciences and humanities represent different kinds of tools that can work in concert to provide a more holistic understanding of the mechanisms underlying human experience. With this understanding in view, I will end the talk by advocating for a re-examination of Timothy Leary's work in light of the concepts I've covered so far. At psychedelics conferences, Leary is frequently blamed for causing the backlash against the first generation of psychedelic research. This oversimplified story relies on a superficial caricature that discourages intellectual engagement with his ideas. But rather than a two-dimensional scapegoat, Leary was in many ways a nuanced thinker who pioneered a range of ideas that were ahead of their time, including challenges to the tenets of behaviorism. As an example of oversimplification, Leary's dropout catchphrase has been associated with irresponsibility, but its deeper meaning relates to Leary's insights about how language shapes our experience of reality. He recognized that the convenient stories we tell ourselves have a hypnotizing effect that subtly restricts our, our perception. For Leary, as for Huxley before him, psychedelics counteract this tendency by removing the blinders imposed by beliefs and expectations allowing us to experience possibilities that were previously hidden as blind spots behind our concepts, like discovering a hidden passageway behind a painting. Dropping out in this sense means letting go of the expectation of a solid wall so that you can think to look behind the painting. I'm arguing that Leary's caricature is itself a painting that distracts from our ability to learn from his ideas. Leary was a pioneer in theorizing the necessary role of experimental language in psychedelic research. As Leary described in 1961 correspondence with Gerald Hurd, which I found in his archive at the New York Public Library, one of the great challenges in our research is after communication. How can we describe it? The limitations of scientific prose become so apparent. My experience with psychedelics has made me less satisfied with abstract and general terms. In writing up our research, I've been experimenting with new modes of communication. The challenge of describing psychedelic experiences forced Leary to explore ideas that I touched on earlier, including the extent to which our everyday language about subjective experiences is inherently abstract and imprecise. Leary felt that poetic language is the only way to get around this problem, as he explained in a 1965 essay. He wrote, if you plan to communicate internal states using external symbols, including words, you must smash through the external linguistic conventions, alter sequences, turn words up upside down, cut up and reassemble verbal sequences from all the relevant sources. To describe externals, you must become a scientist. To describe experience, you must become an artist. The old distinction between people and artists and scientists must vanish. Thus, uh, Bill Richards opens sacred knowledge with an apologia, writing, so it is that in being the best wordsmith I can within these pages, I move fairly freely between scientific and poetic modes of expression. There are two major implications of this. The first is that the humanities should be central to the future development of psychedelic studies, in addition to the arts. The second is that we need to experiment with language, that the need to experiment with language has wider implications, since new words and concepts offer new ways of thinking and communicating, even in other non-psychedelic contexts. In the words of Richard Doyle, psychedelics take language to its limit and encourage its innovation. At this stage in the field's development, we need to be mindful about the language we use to advocate for psychedelic research with the wider public, which means not overselling their benefits at the expense of their dangers. To facilitate this process, I'll sign off with a, with a few useful metaphors. I've often heard psychedelics compared to a surgeon's knife. In the hands of a child, a knife is extremely dangerous, while in the hands of a trained surgeon, the same knife can be life-saving. But I think radiation provides a more specific analogy for psychedelic psychotherapy. Radiation can destroy cancer in the context of radiation therapy, but it can cause cancer in an uncontrolled environment like Fukushima. Psychedelics are similarly agnostic. They can facilitate healing from PTSD, 
but they can also be traumatizing in unsupportive circumstances. This metaphor has been helpful for me in my classes as a check against oversimplifying the conversation in either direction. And from a meta perspective, this whole presentation is a natural extension of psychedelics' ability to facilitate communication between brain regions that are usually disconnected, as recent brain scans with psilocybin and LSD from Imperial College London have suggested. Since new ideas and creative insights arise as a result of thinking outside of our habitual thought patterns, we should encourage more research that crosses over traditional disciplinary boundaries. So uh, thank you for listening to this. Um, and I also actually have a recording that was sent to me just a few days ago by uh, Leonard Picard. Does anyone know who Leonard Picard is? Just the show of hands. So he's an acid chemist who is, well, it was purported acid chemist who has been in maximum security federal prison in the United States for 16 years now, I believe. Um, and so he wrote a book called The Rose of Paracelsus, which is a, a fictionalized nonfiction account of his psychedelic adventures. And so he recorded a special message to everyone at EGA from prison. Hello, dear friends at EGA 2017. Uh, this is uh, Leonard Picard uh, calling from the depths of uh, the American system to uh, send great blessings to all of the attendees at EGA and to uh, say how wonderful it is that you have such uh, grand speakers. Eric Davis, uh, Ben Sessa with his uh, psychotherapeutic approach, uh, the inestimable Tom Roberts, Neshe Diveneau, the uh, leading literary analyst, uh, and of the locals, uh, the most interesting talk on microdosing by Vince Polito. As you may know, microdosing was uh, first uh, noted among clandestine manufacturers in the early 60s, uh, sub-threshold doses. And a very important talk by Cameron Francis on NBOM, uh, the most deleterious uh, lethal hallucinogen that uh, must be addressed by the community. But on a happier note, a little blessing uh, for EGA 17 from the Navajo. Above us, peace. Below us, peace. Behind us, peace. Before us, peace. May everyone have an exceptional experience at EGA 17. This is Leonard. Farewell. And I also have a short clip of him reading from The Rose of Paracelsus. So I'll just play a few minutes of this. Good, a gift for you, a little reading from The Rose. Um, set in a cafe in Salzburg, Austria, where chemist Indigo places his forehead to mine and induces a series of altered states of sounds, images, thoughts, and feelings. Here we are. He placed his hands together in prayer and brought his forehead to mine. Listen, he said. 20.2 kilometers above the Serengeti, the quietness of a geospatial satellite. Low clouds and landmass rotating beneath. From the edge of the Gorongoro crater, the high desert wind. Over Congo at Mai Denombe Lock, 10,000 snowy egrets rising as one. Over Laos, a bamboo flute played by a naked child and the clapping of an old man in loincloth, the children of all the earth, jubilant, shrieking, Laplanders, Yakut, Arctic Inuits, Viennese crowds sobbing, trying to touch Beethoven's casket, howling dark wreckage of a dying planet. Okay, I'll stop it there, but I recommend reading the book in full, The Rose of Paracelsus, and thank you so much, and I welcome a few questions. Um, you were saying that you had, uh, when it came to the research that you were doing and people that were having psychedelic experiences, w did you have them both write or uh, say things when it came to being under the influence as well as after? Not in the NYU study. The NYU study was done uh, with interviews that happened after the fact. Some of them were a month later, some of them were like, up to a year later. So, but there, that was what was recommended by the family and her Nilfar family. She said it would be, you know, they had a very super structured approach to like, what is this picture? But she thought that that was very preliminary and really advocated for more work being done with people actually generating writing during their experiences. Uh, when it comes to increasing the language that we can use, 
what do you think some good ways to go about that would be? Uh, well, being really committed to trying to, because like I said, in, in I, my dissertation worked with nitrous oxide trials in 1800 in England, and people often would just say, like, that was sublime, and then they would just leave it at that. And so if people accept that it's just, oh, it's ineffable, sometimes they don't really, like, sit with it. So to develop, to cultivate a practice of sitting with the experience, and even in the face of daunting tasks of how do you describe it, just let, letting it flow out and just free writing, you know, and developing a kind of a way of just being with language in that experience. And then reading reports of other people, so whether that's published accounts like Huxley's or whether it's forums online like you know um, Arrowhead or any other kind of website that has trip reports so just seeing the ways that other people explain things because sometimes like I teach Alan Watts's The Joyous Cosmology in my classes and I read through that text and I've read it more than 10 times now and I just keep finding little gems where I was like wow I know exactly what he's talking about and I never thought I'd ever be able to find someone who could actually put that into words so it's as you find pieces they kind of plug into your own tools that you could then use to both explain and navigate your own experiences so that's basically my kind of fast answer to that <laughs> and a last question uh, hi th thanks for your talk um, I just have a quick question regarding uh, something you mentioned uh, about like the cataloging of all the different experiences. Um, I, interestingly, a lot of well, some of the psychedelic traditions I'm aware of actually have a certain taboo around talking about your experiences and it's more of a secret, private sort of thing. And uh, there's certain reasons for that, I guess. But I wanted to know what in your opinion, what's the main benefit of, of making such a big database of different people's experiences and looking for parallels within them? Well, in terms of the larger, I mean, some people believe also that we shouldn't try to convince like the general public about the value of psychedelics and just keep it underground. And there are definitely different approaches. But if the goal is to advocate for why, you know, more respect or at least tolerance for people who do choose to you could consume psychedelics or plant medicines of various kinds. The stories about those experiences are often really the things that impact people. I've found this when I've been talking to people myself, you know, going to non-psychedelic conferences or speaking to colleagues in other fields. And it's the, it's the little, the sound bites about like what people are actually saying that are so impactful. Like one of the Horizons conferences I went to, a woman stood up and said, her mother had been one of the study participants in one of the uh, psilocybin studies, and her mother had said the experience was so profound that it, for her it justified having cancer. And it's, it's things like that, that when you hear people, the extent of people responding and sharing the meaning of things and you know have, coming to terms with death of family or friends or loved ones and really kind of moving past trauma, those stories are really impactful and it's hard to write those things off. So that's my basic premise or my kind of take on it, at least at this point. But thanks for the question. And thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it.